He was a beloved father working hard to provide for his family. He was a family man. He was a good guy. He was a very doting parent. He had settled in as a typical suburban father. Until a cold-blooded assassin descended on the local gas station. It was so brutal. It literally was just done with no regard for this man's life. We had a rather big whodunit. You got a guy with a hot temper. Who did he piss off? The investigation would take detectives into the upper echelons of wealthy Ohio society to catch a killer out for revenge. Are they going to retaliate against me? This is scary. Saturday, June 16th, 2001. It's a busy weekend in the quiet Midwestern town of Akron, Ohio. It's a suburban area, really, with these large, sprawling homes, lots of acreage. And, you know, it has its strip malls. It has its suburban communities. It was Father's Day weekend and quite crowded. There was a lot of traffic. Then suddenly, a shot rings out amidst the crowd of shoppers. I need immediate help. We have gunshot wound at BJ's Wholesale Club. He's got a gunshot wound to his face. He's bleeding profusely. Is he conscious? He barely. The incident occurred at a warehouse pub at their gas station, so a public area. And here you have a person pulling up in a motorcycle and shooting one shot. It was just like so nonchalant. It wasn't at night, it wasn't sneaky. There were several people who witnessed it, but the person was wearing a helmet and a mask so that he could not be identified. The assassin's target is a man sitting alone in an SUV. By the time police arrive, he is already dead. The victim is identified as 44-year-old local businessman, Jeff Zack. When it went through my mind, I was wondering who, who would do something like this and hurt his family like this. Before settling down in Akron, Jeff Zack had grown up in another Rust Belt town, Detroit, Michigan. Jeff Zack was born in 1957, and from what I understand, he was abandoned by his birth father. The divorce was very hard on my children. In those years, it was very unusual to get divorced, and it was just very hard. Jeff Zack was fortunate in that his mother remarried and he had a stepfather who was apparently quite prominent in his life and took a good deal of interest in him. He was my firstborn child, my firstborn son. He was very smart, very vivacious, very interesting kid. Jeff's parents encouraged him to pursue his dreams. So in his early 20s, he decided to leave his hometown behind. Jeff Zack decided to branch out and see the world. He traveled to Israel. Uh, most people of Jewish ancestry have automatic dual citizenship over there. He joined the IDF, which is the army for Israel. He wanted to become a pilot, but he didn't quite qualify. He couldn't become what he wanted to become. He had to join the Air Force and become a paratrooper for the Israeli Air Force. But he learned how to speak Hebrew fluently, plus a lot of Arabic and a lot of other languages. But after completing his tour of duty, Jeff struggled to settle back into civilian life in the United States. He had the kind of personality that alienated a lot of people. He could be successful at times, but he had an abrasive attitude. He was this big, kind of in-your-face type of guy. You know, you didn't want to piss Jeff Zack off. He was trying to be rich. He did whatever he had to do to survive. Until one day, Jeff met the woman who would change his life forever. Bonnie and Jeff met in Arizona. 
in 1986. And they fell madly in love, and they kind of just ran away together. They were quickly married afterwards. Before long, they had a child together. Brian was born after a few years, so they were ecstatic. And he has always been the sweetest, most darling child. And they lived in San Diego for a couple of years. And then they decided to move back to Akron. Her parents lived in Akron. And they thought they could do better there and would have family there. They lived in a uh, single family dwelling in a nice area called Stowe, which is a suburb of Akron. When I think about Jeff, I think of him as like a family man, a person I was proud to meet, and he loved his son. He was a very doting parent. He was very involved in his son's life. But Jeff would never get the chance to see his son grow up. Now he's been gunned down in cold blood by an unknown assailant. And Akron police want to know why. He was a great father. And he was a husband. And he was murdered in broad daylight. It just didn't make sense. Brian was 12 and a half when Jeffrey was murdered. So mean. Right before Father's Day. I never just couldn't get it, you know, on why who would do something like this to him. Coming up, was Jeff Zack the family man he appeared to be? He liked to talk to women, and sometimes they got him in trouble. Forty-four-year-old Jeff Zack has been murdered outside a busy shopping center in the suburbs of Akron. As detectives speak to witnesses at the scene, they are stunned by the brazenness of the attack. Mr. Zack pulled into a gas station, and an individual came up on a motorcycle, stopped, shot um, Mr. Zack in the face. He did this during daylight, which is, he had a lot of nerve. The killer had been careful to cover his tracks. Investigators managed to find only one piece of evidence. A projectile was found at the scene about 100 yards from the vehicle that Jeff Sack was in. That was a good find, but there was nothing really to compare it with. And although the shooting occurred in public, no one is able to provide a clear description. The shooting happened so quickly that no one really had the time to get a good look at the perpetrator. That person wore dark clothing and a motorcycle helmet with full darkened face mask, so the face couldn't be seen. However, witnesses did get a good look at the killer's motorcycle. It was a ninja-style motorcycle. They call them crotch rockets. It was like a racing motorcycle, one that the witnesses said were, was built for high speed. It was one of those bikes that you lay forward on, and it has high horsepower. It was black and white, trimmed in green, like a fluorescent or a candy apple green. Investigators issue an alert, but without a license plate number, they know the chances of finding it are slim. Even though this murder took place on Father's Day weekend in a crowded parking lot on a shopping day, the police really didn't have much to go on. What do you have, really? You have this shadowy figure who pulls in, commits a murder, and drives away. Nothing else. No one seems to have any idea who might want to kill Jeff. But his wife, Bonnie, is able to give detectives a promising lead. Shortly before his murder, there was a phone call to the resident indicating that you have one more chance to get out of this. And Bonnie told Jeff about that phone call, and he was very nervous about it. 
At the job sites, he would tell me that he was getting a phone call, and I'd be like, Jeff, just don't worry about it. Don't get stressed out. Just let's get the job done. And I never knew it would just end up to the situation that it ended up to. We recovered that voicemail, and it was basically it was a real threat to Jeff Zach that he had a short time left and that he better do the right thing. Investigators want to know, who was this mysterious caller? She holds nothing back. She says, look, my husband, he was involved in some really shady business. Here was a guy who had a very bad temper, who had business dealings that had gone south, numerous bad business dealings. So this was a guy who made enemies spontaneously. He was arrogant, abrasive. And when you deal with a victim that's like that, your investigation is going to go into a bunch of different directions. You have to keep an open mind and follow up on everything. Detectives learned that one of Jeff's bad business deals led to a heated argument in the weeks before his death. Jeff and Bonnie's house had wind and rain damage to it, and these two uh, independent contractors were going to repair it. Well, they took the money, and then they ended up not doing the work, and Jeff was threatening to turn them over for insurance fraud, and there was exchange of words between them. One of the contractors, we thought, was the one that had threatened him. He remained a suspect up until he took him past the polygraph and, and uh, was eliminated as a suspect. When investigators ask friends and family if Jeff had problems with anyone else, one name immediately comes to mind. He would talk about, you know, this lady. I, I never did knew her, but he would always talk about this certain lady. Jeff was hardly a monogamous husband. There was a long-time affair with a local woman uh, named Cynthia George. Cindy George was married to a man who owned a huge restaurant. I heard of Cynthia George and Ed George because they own Tangiers in Akron. And it's a, Tangiers is a pretty prominent place. They were considered elite in Akron, not the average by any means. After work, you know, uh, Jeff Zach, he would always, he would more or less have reasons to go over there to hang out. But according to Bonnie, her husband was doing a lot more than just hanging out. Jeff Zach and Bonnie Zach would be in the Tangiers and Cynthia would walk by and just the eye contact alone between them, you could tell there was something going on. Bonnie was devastated. Cindy pretended to be a good friend of the family and of Jeffrey's. But we all suspected that it was an affair. Detectives sit down with Bonnie Zach and they have to empathize with her a little bit. I mean. This woman just lost her husband, the father of her children. Their affair had also led to other complications. As Bonnie described the relationship between her late husband and Cynthia George, she disclosed that not only were they lovers, they shared something else in common. They shared a love child. In fact, one of the George's children, who Ed George embraced as his own, was apparently Jeff Zack's offspring. Coming up, did his wife's infidelity drive Ed George over the edge? As a jilted husband, he had the motivation to have him taken out. Detectives in Akron, Ohio, have gotten their first lead in the slaying of local businessman Jeff Zach. After speaking with his widow, Bonnie, investigators have ruled her out. They found her to be relatively gracious, relatively honest, did not seem suspicious in any way. And according to Bonnie, Jeff had been cheating on her with one of the most powerful women in the city, nightclub owner Cynthia George. In May, of 2001, right before the homicide. Bonnie found out about it. Jeff told her that he cut it off. 
Could Jeff's killer be his ex-lover or her husband? Detectives told me that they suspected Ed George as a culprit because he seemed to have a motive. His wife had had a child with Jeff Zack. Maybe he felt shame. As investigators dig deeper into the George's marriage, they learn that Ed and Cynthia had always been an odd match. Cynthia grew up in North Canton, which is south of Akron, and it's kind of a Rust Belt town. Cynthia George had come from rather humble stock herself. She was the daughter of a coal miner, and the family struggled. The Georges were wealthier and had the Tangiers restaurant. And I think some of the Georges felt as though Cindy was not good enough for Ed George. The couple had first met when Cynthia auditioned to become a dancer at the Tangier in 1978. But as soon as Ed laid eyes on her, he had other plans. Cynthia was Mrs. Ohio runner-up at one time. So here is this beautiful woman kind of gracefully walking throughout this club at night. She was a strikingly beautiful woman, and Ed was a successful man, and the chemistry seemed to work for them. Soon they got married. If Cynthia George was looking for a golden ticket, certainly Ed George was it. You know, when investigators look at this, they're like, well, wait a minute. Cynthia George, Ed George, very wealthy. And here's Jeff Zack. He lives in a suburban house. He does not have any money. How does it fit? After gathering all their information, detectives quite reasonably decided to pay a visit to Cynthia George. They begin asking her questions because she's connected to this victim. You know, she's like, who, me? I have done nothing. I, I don't know anything. She did admit that she knew Jeff Zack, but she wouldn't elaborate any more than that. Cynthia George may not want to talk, but her husband has a lot to say about Jeff Zack. Ed George wasn't home when investigators first questioned Cynthia. So they go to Ed, and they want to question him. Ed tells this kind of contradictory story to what his wife had told. He described Jeff Zack as something of a menace. He said that Jeff Zack had been phoning the house, he'd been calling the house and hanging up. To Ed George, he wasn't just a nuisance. Jeff Zack was a harasser. Now we have two different stories from a married couple who both know the victim. Wow. You got to look further into that. To find out whether Bonnie Zack's claim about the George's child is true, they request a court order for a DNA sample. Police wanted to confirm whether this tale about Jeff Zack fathering a child with Cynthia George was indeed true. I mean, at this point, you know, they're hearing information from people, but it's basically gossip. Cynthia and Ed George are very prominent in the community of Akron. So when this did come out regarding Jeff Sack possibly fathering a child with Cynthia, I mean, it was unbelievable. It was just mind-boggling to people. Ultimately, police were successful in obtaining a court order to uh, force the George's child to take a paternity test. When the test results came back, it turned out that biologically she was not a George's child. She was indeed Jeff Zack's child. At this point, police realized Cynthia George had been carrying around a very weighty secret. If Ed discovered the truth, it seems plausible that he'd want to take his revenge. But investigators know that isn't the only possibility. They're thinking, geez, either Cynthia or Ed George could have hired someone to kill Jeff Zack. Or maybe it was Cynthia George herself on that motorcycle who killed Jeff Zack. Maybe it was Ed George. 
she had motives for getting rid of Jeff Zack because now there could be a custody battle. And Ed George had motive because if he did know, maybe he was so shamed by this scandal that he wanted to get rid of Jeff Zack. Coming up, a new suspect unexpectedly enters the picture. Police get a call and bang, this thing just opens wide. Several months into the investigation of Jeff Zack's murder, Akron police are looking into millionaire couple Ed and Cynthia George and their relationship with the victim. Cynthia and Jeff had a relationship for approximately seven years. They even had a baby together. However, detectives still have no hard evidence tying either of them to the crime. Jeff Zack was a pest. He was a harasser. He was the father of one of the George's children. But there was nothing really beyond that. Because they don't have enough evidence really to charge Cynthia or Ed George. What do they do? They've taken it as far as they can go. I thought the investigation just stopped, you know, for some reason. Then everything came out. On the one year anniversary of Jeff Zack's death, the Akron Beacon Journal publishes an article about the case. It leads to the breakthrough investigators were hoping for. Shortly after the article ran, a tipster phoned the Akron Police Department and said, I know who, who the shooter is. And that tip comes with a name, John Zafino. John Zafino is this kind of short, stocky guy, you know, mustache, slick back hair, a wannabe gangster. If you're looking for like a profile of a murderer, John Zafino, he fits it. But here's a question. Why would John Zafino murder Jeff Zack? When investigators track down John Zafino, he refuses to answer any questions. But his ex-wife is more than willing to talk to police. It was just a cold case for a year. And then Christine Zafino, who was John Zafino's former wife, came forth and said she suspected that John Safino and Cindy were involved in the killing of Jeff. He had told her things that made her suspicious. The police were investigating him. According to Christine, John Zafino had admitted to her that he had recently had an altercation with Jeff Zeck. And she asked him straight out, are you the guy who shot him? He said something to the effect of, well, let's put it this way. He's going to have a hard time parting his hair from now on. When detectives play the threatening voicemail on Jeff's answering machine, Christine is absolutely certain it's him. She said, no doubt about it. That is the voice of my ex-husband, John Zafino. If anybody should be able to recognize his voice, it would be ex-wife. Christine also has a good idea what his motive might have been. Even though John Zafino and Christine Todaro had broken up, she kept track of different occurrences in her ex's life. And she knew that he had been dating a woman who was attractive and older and had money. And they say, well, do you know her name? She says, yeah, I know her name. She's very popular in town. Her name's Cynthia George. So where's the common denominator? Where's the connection between John Zafino and Jeff Zack? Well, the connection was at the Tangiers. Cynthia George. This was not a love triangle so much as it was a lover's quadrangle. While Cynthia George was married to Ed George, she was having affairs with both Jeff Zack and police determined John Zafina. John was kind of a blue collar guy. And Cindy originally was a blue collar woman, so maybe there was this attraction there. How much she really got deep into a relationship with John Zafino is possibly still a question. But their relationship developed 
at least significantly. At this point, Cynthia is refusing to speak with investigators and does not admit to an affair with John. But DMV records provide detectives with another piece of evidence. They discovered that, lo and behold, a month before Jeff Zach's death, what had John Zafino purchased? A motorcycle. Now, not just any motorcycle, a black and lime green motorcycle, like the one seen at the crime scene. My captain, uh, Beth Doherty, found the motorcycle in Pennsylvania on a publication called uh, Cycle Trader. And that's when my Schaefer and I were tasked with going to recover it. We located the bike and we learned that he had transported there at night. He was desperate to get rid of the motorcycle and that uh, he wanted to trade it for any car that they had on the lot. It's enough for police to make an arrest. On September 25th, 2002, they take John Zafino into custody. One domino has now fallen in this murder case. But investigators know there will be others. Coming up, did he kill Jeff Zach to keep Cynthia George to himself? Or was he a hired gun? Investigators are saying, look, was Cynthia involved? Was Ed involved? Did they pay you to do this? Investigators in Akron, Ohio, have arrested one of Cynthia George's lovers, John Zafino, for the murder of her other lover, Jeff Zach. But they believe there is still more to the story. We cleared Ed George of any involvement in this, and Cindy remained a suspect, but we didn't know how much until John Zafino became a suspect. And then the more he became a suspect, the more the involvement of Cindy was believed. Under interrogation, John tries to deny everything. John Zafino says, I'm totally innocent. I had nothing to do with this. In fact, I was at a car show in Pennsylvania the day the murder occurred. So I have an alibi. People were located that he supposedly was with and interviewed, and they didn't support his alibi as far as timing. He had enough time to do the murder and travel down there and use that as his alibi, and it didn't hold up. His phone records proved to be even more incriminating. Then you look at the phone records, immediately after the homicide, who does he call? He calls Cindy George. John Zafino talked to Cynthia George just before Jeff Zack was murdered and just after he was murdered. Now, why would he do that? He would do that for two reasons. One, to say, I'm on my way to kill him, and a second time to say, I just killed him. Prosecutors offer John a plea agreement in exchange for testimony against Cindy, but still, he refuses to talk. Obviously, we wanted him to cooperate. He did not do that. So there's two inferences to draw, that Cindy wasn't involved or he's loyal to Cindy and was not going to ride her out. They could tie John Zafino directly to the motorcycle, and they knew that his alibi was false. And so they said, all right, let's take this guy to trial. In February of 2003, almost two years after the crime, John Zafino stands trial for the murder of Jeff Zack. Even though Cynthia George was not on trial herself, the foundation of the case revolved around Cynthia George. Cynthia George was apparently John Zafino's motive for committing this murder. What the prosecution presented was that Cynthia had an affair with Jeff Zack. And when it ultimately ended, Jeff Zack kind of couldn't let it go. And he kept trying to contact Cynthia. Cynthia said, this gentleman's harassing me, and I would like you to take care of it. And allegedly, John did. They even put Cynthia George herself on the witness stand. 
Cynthia was called as a witness to his trial. She pleads the fifth. Why would you do that? You would do that if you had things to hide. You would do that if you thought what I say is going to get me in trouble. For the jury, Cynthia's silence is just as incriminating as anything she could have said. On March 11th, 2003, John Zafina was found guilty of murder. He was given life with, I believe, the first opportunity for a parole hearing it would be 23 years later. He's sent away forever on a murder charge. Now, what will that do to John Zafino? Still, John refuses to talk. We were hoping that John Zafino would testify against Cindy. That just never occurred. The public sentiment by the end of 2004 was that Cynthia George was the mastermind of this murder. Everybody was talking about that. It was horrible. And I did some interviews purposely because I wanted it out there that I felt Cindy was involved. It isn't until the following year that investigators feel they have enough evidence to finally prosecute her. The big break was that John Zafino and Cynthia George were talking. There were calls from the prison to her that were recorded. And those calls started to reveal that perhaps there was a conspiracy here to commit murder and that Cynthia was involved. The prosecution believes that Cynthia George was basically paying money to John Zafino. And John was dangling over her head with this ambiguous threat, if you will, that he was going to drop a dime on her at any moment if she didn't pay. On January 10th, 2005, Cynthia George is placed under arrest. Police moved in on Cynthia George as she was shopping. She was arrested very publicly in a very public place. The reason for it was twofold. One, they wanted to make a statement to the town, to the city, that they never gave up on this case. Number two, they wanted to put fear into Cynthia, to let her know that, listen, you're not above the law. The police called me to tell me that they had indicted Cindy and that they arrested her, and I was ecstatic. Coming up, will Cynthia George be convicted? Or will wealth and power help get her off the hook for murder? If you got money, you can buy your way out of most of anything. More than four years after Jeff Zack was killed, Akron millionaire Cynthia George stands trial for conspiracy to commit his murder. This case attracted a lot of interest in the city of Akron. This case had everything, really, that the public ate up. Affairs, illegitimate child, wealthy people. Due to the widespread media coverage, Cynthia's lawyers make a surprising request. Cindy was afraid that maybe that publicity would have affected the jury. Rather than being tried by a jury of her peers, she decided to have a bench trial, which meant her fate would be decided by a judge. The old adage is everybody wants a fair trial as long as it's in their favor. On November 14th, 2005, prosecutors make their opening arguments before the judge. The prosecution had some concerns because they didn't have really John Safino saying, yeah, she told me to kill him. But what they did have is they had a lot of document evidence, meaning they could show money changing hands. When authorities accessed the financial records, they discovered that a month or so before the murder, $5,300 had come out of Cynthia George's account. 
and approximately $5,300 had been used to purchase the motorcycle that was used to kill Jeff Zack. It was just too coincidental, all of the bank statements that matched what was out of Cynthia's account to the penny. They also draw attention to the communication between Cynthia George and John Zafino at the time of the shooting. Remember the phone calls? The phone call before the murder and the phone call after the murder. Was that a coincidence? I was very happy because I knew evidence was coming out against her and that she would probably be found guilty. However, Cynthia never admits to an affair with John, and the defense argues the state's evidence is purely circumstantial. Even though you could imply that Cynthia George may have been involved in this case, there was no concrete evidence that she was the puppeteer in all this. In fact, it was entirely possible that John Zafino, who was a bit of a hothead, decided to kill Jeff Zack on his own. Those records don't prove that Cynthia knew what he was going to use that motorcycle for. On November 28th, the court reconvenes to hear the judge's decision. Everybody reassembled in the courtroom. Cynthia George stood up, she faced the judge, and the judge said, I have rendered my verdict. She was found guilty. I was very satisfied. Cynthia George was sentenced to life in prison. You can hear her family wailing in the courtroom, and it's pretty heartbreaking. Her family became hysterical, but I, of course, was happy. I felt that justice was served. Cynthia wastes no time in submitting an appeal. The conviction of Cynthia George was appealed up to the Ninth District Court of Appeals, alleging errors occurred at the trial court level, which caused her to be found guilty. She hired the best appellate lawyers she could get. And, you know, the thing is, it's very, very unlikely that an appellate court would overturn a murder conviction. So she was not facing an uphill battle. She was facing Mount Everest here. But a year and a half later, she achieves what many believe to be impossible. On March 21st, 2007, the charges against Cynthia George were dismissed by the Court of Appeals. That appeal decision just really blew everybody involved in this case away. It really did. When you read their opinion, they wanted evidence of solicitation and procure. They wanted a conversation from the state where Cindy George is asking John Safino to commit the murder. We did not have that. We had solely circumstantial evidence. After her release, the George family releases a statement saying their faith had sustained them and that they are moving forward with their lives as a family. Last I heard, Cynthia George was, you know, living the happy, elite life with her husband and her kids, who are all grown now. In my eyes, Cynthia George got away with murder. It's a sentiment shared by many in the city of Akron. Many felt that a woman of wealth and privilege seemed to have taken revenge on a former lover, something Cynthia George has always denied. Do I think that George's money, status, and standing in the community had anything to do with that verdict being overturned? Hell yeah, I do. Cindy had the benefit of great attorneys. She got top legal help in this case. The fact that she got out after 16 months kind of upset me, and I miss them horribly. This horrible loss that took a lot of years of pain and anguish. I don't think anybody suffers as much as a mother. 